All right, my friends, welcome back to All Cars. I am John. It is time for another Motor Week Retro Review Reaction. This week it is the 1999 Daewoo model lineup. Now, I had a couple of other things I was going to do this week, um, including one comparison test. But when I saw this one, I just had to do it. Come on. Junky, trashy, bad, 1990s cars. Right up my alley. So, let's see what MotorWeek says about them when they were new. MotorWeek is made possible by Lucas Oil, Auto Value and Bumper to Bumper, and TireRack.com. Everyone that sees this new Deu Laganza asks the same question. Who or what is a Deu? Korean industrial giant Daewoo is one of the world's largest corporations, and it's also the company that built the short-lived Pontiac Le Mans compact of the early 1990s. Well, after that experience, Daewoo decided that it was time to bring its own cars to America. And after years of development, they have arrived with a trio of small to mid-sized sedans. But Daewoo hopes to avoid many of the same obstacles that their Korean competitors, Hyundai and Kia, hit when they landed on our shores. So it's trying a different approach, a very different approach. And so let's jump in here right off the bat. Um, and I'm going to touch on a couple of things I may expand on later. First off, styling. I don't love it. Uh, you know, the, the, the Daewoo symbol goes like this. And they put that in the hood and then in the grill. And it never quite works. Uh, kind of these bubulous insectoid headlights, this weird shaped grill it it doesn't work um i'll talk more about the styling later on it's interesting how he pronounces it de u not de wu i've always heard it with the w pronounced uh, more strongly than that but the pontiac le mans i think it was probably if i had to guess two years ago i did a retro review reaction on the le mans and back in the 90s i was looking for a new car and I was, did not want a Japanese car. And I was, I was pro-American when it came to buying cars. And I discovered this car that was uh, originally designed in Germany. It was being built in South Korea. And it came here as a Pontiac. And it was among the worst reliability of any car at least according to Consumer Reports. So needless to say, I was fascinated with it. I could never find one for sale. And so I never ended up owning one. Um, but it's hard to believe this company looked at what they were building, the quality of it, sending it to America, all the negative reviews, and then being like, yeah, we need to build cars for that market. And so this is what they came out with. Um, let's see what they say. Because Daewoo is bypassing traditional marketing approaches and using a new group of buyers to sell the cars to each other. Daewoo is recruiting college students to sell the cars on over 400 campuses nationwide and locating its first 14 dealerships in major college towns. The line that they will be selling starts with the entry-level Lano subcompact. Okay, before we get into it, um, dumbest idea in the history of marketing. I am sure that they had highly paid people on staff. They probably hired consultants. How should we break into the U.S. market? And they came up with college students. Now, this was shortly, 1999, this was after I had graduated from college, but not so far I've forgotten. And many, many, many students in America get student loans, which means we're paying our tuition, we're paying some rent, we're trying to eat. If we have money left over, we're buying beer and hot wings. At least I did. So the idea that I was going to buy a new car was inconceivable. And the idea that other people would buy a car from a poor, starving college student who would, you know, probably sell an organ for money is stupid. Now, to be fair, I went to college with a lot of people who mommy or daddy just paid for it and they had a nice new car to drive. So maybe it's not totally as dumb as it always appeared, but there you're working on 
hey, Dad, I need a new car. I need you to go spend, you know, ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. And my drinking buddy recommended a Daewoo. I just don't see it. And uh, history says it didn't work out. Available in both three- and four-door configurations, the Lanos would be an unremarkable little number were it not for its funky Morris minor-looking corporate grille. It's powered by a buzzy 1.6-liter dual overhead cam four-cylinder engine that makes 105 horsepower and 106 pound-feet of torque. Transmission choices for all day ooze are a standard five-speed manual or optional four-speed automatic with driver-selectable shift modes. With the automatic transmission, our test car ran a respectable 0 to 60 time of 11.4 seconds. We didn't care for the drivetrain's rough character, but the front McPherson strut and rear dual-link suspension concept used in all-day ooze delivered surprisingly good subcompact handling. Braking was also good, with stops from 60 averaging 126 feet. Front disc and rear drums are standard with ABS optional. On oh, oh, okay, before they before they move, let me turn this here so y'all don't have to stare at it sideways. Styling. It's okay. Uh, the rear end right here, honestly, there's a touch of BMW in those taillights. The front insectoid headlights, that weird grill that just doesn't do it for me, it's okay. Honestly... So, I think everything for Daewoo is like, it's fine, but it never really generates that that level of sophistication, of refinement, of elegance that you would get from like a BMW, or even, in this case, from a Corolla or a Civic, and this is smaller than those. Performance is fine, it's slow. Braking's okay. You know, they said the engine was buzzy. That's interesting. They actually said something about the engine twice there. But did you hear the gear shifter? When they showed the automatic going through the gears, is like very cheap sounding. Um, I will say this, though. Looking back in history, looking at this... It may not be competitive with offerings from Honda or Toyota, but this looks like it was what the Hyundai Accent became later on. From that perspective, it, it almost looks more advanced than some of what Hyundai was offering. I interesting juxtaposition there for me. That's optional. On public roads, the Lano certainly felt better than Hyundai's early efforts, but it won't impress older drivers raised on Honda and Toyota products. But young first-time buyers may like the interior styling, which is dominated by garish seat fabrics. In its defense, however, the Lano's interior is quite roomy. The Hold on a second here. First, I miss seats like this. Whether it was this or the, the neon or any number of other seats from the 90s, I miss seats having personality. Whereas today, you get the same drab interiors over and over again, and the manufacturers are like, yes, but look at the stitching. You know, I, I, no. Now, red stitching does not make the interior fun. And how could they criticize the garish seats here, and then let this guy get in the car with that shirt on. Honestly. Makes me makes me wish I had one of my more interesting beach shirts on right now. Uh, interior dashboard, it's fine. I mean, it looks like cheap plastic with cheap plastic on cheap plastic, but it seems to be just fine and probably pretty competitive with this subcompact market. Dash is very utilitarian with nothing we haven't seen before. While rear seat room is a bit tight for adult legs, but offers more headroom than many bigger cars. The trunk is large, but needs a bigger opening for bulky loads. Lano's prices start at a low $8,749. The most expensive version carries a base price of $12,519. Okay, before they go on, um, great price. Really impressive price. Uh, <laughs> low price offsets relatively poor performance. But they said the back seat was tight. And did you see how much room that guy had in front of his legs? And how much headroom he had? 
it, it maybe it's tight this way, but that trunk holding a big suitcase and they're like, well, the opening's a little small. I don't know that I've ever said this, but this motor week feels biased a little bit. Um, maybe, maybe what I'm detecting is that it's that bad and they're trying to put a somewhat positive spin on it. Optimism, right? But this is the first one where I'm like, no, I think, I think they've got a beef here. Let's, let's see what they do. Next in line is the compact Nubira, which is available as a four-door sedan as well as a five-door wagon and hatchback. We tried out the sedan, which carries its smooth Toyota-like styling on a longer 101.2-inch wheelbase. The Nubira is... Oh, before they, before they go on there, um, let's back up just a little bit. I like the styling on this a lot better. Um, this would be, I guess, in the Corolla size at this point. But it looks bigger than that to me. I like the fact that the headlights are more traditional, boring, if you will. The the grill, it's okay, but the hood into the grill, it, it's all more subdued. It doesn't look upscale, but it does look a lot cleaner to me. And it looks, for all the world at this angle, it looks like a Mazda 626, 323. Look, even the haunches here, the doors and then into that rear quarter panel, this this looks like a, a, a 626 as far as I'm concerned. The Nubera is powered by a 2-liter dual overhead cam 4-cylinder engine making 129 horsepower and 136 pound-feet of torque. Limited time with the new Vera prevented our usual track test, but in normal daily driving, we found that the drivetrain was reasonably strong, but again, it lacked refinement. But the suspension gave the car a tight, nimble feel, again, much like its smaller sibling. The new Vera gets stronger disc brakes all around with anti-lock as an option. Interior-wise, the Nubera is a nice improvement over the Lanos. The dash is more upscale with better control placement, but the seats, despite having a more tasteful appearance, are short and lacking in lower back support. However, the rear cabin provides more head and leg room than a Toyota Corolla. The 13.1 cubic foot trunk beats the Corolla as well. Nubera prices range from $12,250 to $13,050, about what you'd pay for a comparable Hyundai. Um interesting uh dash i didn't like it as much i you know you could make the argument that the first one was the dash was busy this looks like they just didn't know what to do with all the space um again lots of cheap plastic it's the 90s i don't want to harp on it but it was okay it probably presented pretty well great back seat room good trunk room Solid entry, honestly. Again, they mentioned the unrefined powertrain. And I think that's a noisy, buzzy engine. Styling-wise, I don't know. There's a lot going on here, guys. There's. I'll tell you my thoughts. The first is the rear taillights. They're hideous. Who came up with those big triangular clear areas they're too big. They, they, again, bug eyes is what comes to my mind. But I like the flat deck. I like the rounded trunk. There's a lot here to like. That that rear end, with the exception of the tail lights, that reminds me a little bit of like a mini Oldsmobile Alero. And then I can't get over the rounded trapezoidal wheel arches Ugh. not a bad car I, I i don't know how much i wish they would do a comparison of here's a civic here's a corolla here's this to see where it falls because i don't know the base price of a honda a, you know civic or a toyota corolla in 1999 off the top of my head but if this is substantially less expensive this would have been a compelling entry. If it was the same price as a Corolla, then the answer is no. But if it's a lot less expensive, hmm, compelling entry. 
But the big dollars, relatively speaking, are for the Laganza, Daewoo's flagship four-door sedan. It's very unusual for a new Asian company to enter the market with a bigger family size model, and the Laganza's upscale styling should give Daewoo's image an extra boost. So this is going to probably be in the uh, Accord Camry size range. Not a beautiful car. Again, I, I can repeat this over and over again. There's there's a level of sophistication, of elegance, of of refinement in the styling that's just missing and makes it look a little clunky, chunky to me. The front end, again, insectoid headlights, a grill that doesn't work for me, but the rear end is very, well, the, the side and the rear end is very interesting to me. The tail lights don't quite work for me again, and I think it's the thickness of the border around it, and that big white section in the middle. They're, they're not doing anything dainty here. But when you look at this C-pillar right here, this rear quarter panel, the trunk lid, if you, if you, if you put your finger over it and block the tail light, they, bear with me here, there's a little Jaguar in that. And down the side, through the doors and up to that front quarter panel, I'll be darned if there isn't a little infinity in this thing, especially if you look at the wheels, too. There's a lot of elements here that don't quite come together. Again, it's not hideous. It's just not... Wow. I, but a, a lot of interesting little pieces here. Over 15 feet long and riding on a 105.1-inch wheelbase, the Laganza is about the same size as a Mazda 626. But unlike the V6 available Mazda, the only power plant is a 2.2-liter 16-valve four-cylinder that makes 131 horsepower and 148 pound-feet of torque. With the automatic transmission, that's good for a reasonable 0 to 60 time of 10.3 seconds. Suspension setup is similar to other Daewoo's. But in the larger Laganza, it felt overworked, pushing the front end and rolling hard in corners. Braking performance, however, was quite good, with the four-wheel disc and ABS delivering stable, average stops of 120 feet. Easily the classiest of the Daewoo line, the Laganza's well-equipped interior has more head and leg room than Mercedes-Benz C-Class. Um, okay, dashboard rule. So, uh, performance, it's fine. Again, there's nothing here to get excited about. There's nothing to really complain about. Fascinating comment they made about the, the suspension setup in this heavier car suddenly feels overworked. Doesn't that really say they didn't set up the suspension? Um, interior's busy. Uh, looks fully contemporary for the time. That middle part right there with the radio and the HVAC and they're not talking about the HVAC controls and how they work and are they intuitive or not it just looks busy 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 what I can't get over here and I, I imagine that this works perfectly fine in day-to-day -day living right but the triangular shaped air vent right there and squeezing the clock underneath it I could never not see it. I the the lack of symmetry there, uh, and and two things doing this I, that would drive me up the wall. Other than that, it's fine. And a slick Euro style dash with pictograph climate controls. Seating was the best of the line too, with thick padding and good back support. Ditto the rear cabin, which does the front one better by being larger than that of an E class Benz while the trunk is a healthy 14.1 cubic feet. Laganza base prices start at $14,540 and top out at $18,660. While they do show a lot of potential, the Daewoo, Lanus, Nubira, and Laganza are not yet the equals of their established competitors, but they are being sold by a clever, innovative company that's not afraid to take chances. One that will either quickly sink from view or end up teaching us all a few new things about how to sell cars. Well, and we all know that they ended up not succeeding here in America, at least not directly. Um, I don't know much about their history. I, I, when, when these were new, I had a chance to go and look at them. 
Um, I knew about their marketing plan, which I thought was stupid at the time, and still do. And then they just kind of disappeared, and you never really saw them on the streets, right? I, I saw a few here and there, and it was always, I saw them because it was like, what the heck was that? Was that a Daewoo? You know, that kind of response. I don't remember how long they were here, and I swear that they had a sport utility. I'll go look it up. I don't remember what I'm thinking of um, right now, but I don't remember how long they were here. And, you know, their cars are fine. A, a lot of middle-class, mid-range cars... They try to make you feel like you're getting something over on somebody that spent more, right? A great example would be the Camry, right? They, they, they try to put in, you know, like a little aluminum bright work. They try to upscale it a little bit. They'll add a little more sound deadening. But ultimately, you know it's not as good as that Mercedes C or E class, but you can always rest assured you'd paid a lot less money and probably got something more reliable. This, it's like they didn't even try. Like they were aiming for somebody who just wanted a transportation pod. These are okay. And honestly, I am far more interested in them now than I was back then. A, a 1990s car from a... a, a unknown manufacturer that left the marketplace that made, generally speaking, considered junk probably. I would love to drive one. I'd love to find one right now. Um, just because they're so different and, and I imagine relatively rare. So please, if you had one of these, let us know below what your experience was. Did it hold up? Did it fall apart? Which one was it? I think this is fascinating, and I'm fascinated at them because manufacturers can muscle their way into a market if they have the money and the willpower. And these guys came here, and they didn't dip their toe in with one car and then learn from their experience and then start releasing other ones. They dove in with three, and it didn't work out. But there's an awful lot of what if. I, I think that the parent company ran into major problems. I don't really know their history. I think they ran into major problems and that kind of collapsed everything. Because General Motors, if I remember correctly, ended up buying Daewoo uh, in bankruptcy. And now they're GM South Korea and they are now building the tracks. And building and designing the tracks and sending it here. And... I don't really know what happened in the interim there. I'm going to go look up the history of these guys. But a fascinating little car that feels to me like a couple other things changed and broke a slightly different, and this car might still be here today competing with Hyundai and Kia and everybody else. Let me know your thoughts below, guys. I appreciate you being here.